Uh, hello everybody, my name is Mark McGill. I work for the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. I'm here today to talk to you about the Northern Ireland Skills Barometer. Um, one really has to, has to look at a survey of mobile investment companies to see how important skills are to competitiveness. You know, the recent Ernst & Young survey of mobile investment companies, 45% of companies identified either in education, research or skills reason as one of their key investment criteria. So the, so the link between competitive and skills is obvious. Given skills importance within the economy, uh, the Department for Employment and Learning commissioned us to develop a Northern Ireland Skills Barometer. Um, so essentially what that barometer is, is an economic model which is capable of forecasting the number of jobs likely to be created over the next decade, the skills profile of those jobs, and the likely subject areas um, which a qualification would be required to take those jobs. Um, I'll not go into the detail of this in, in, on how you develop a, an economic forecasting model for skills. Um, I could talk about that all day, but I think I would bore you to tears. So if anybody is a particularly nerdy vintage and does want any more information about how the methods about, about developing that, feel free to contact me afterwards. So we have developed a, a skills forecasting model. We did test bed any results we had with industry. So when we got our initial results, we consulted with various sector skills bodies and made adjustments to our modelling approach um, based on the feedback which they, which, which they have given us. So we're pretty confident we've got a robust approach using established data sources alongside taking industry feedback to project the likely future, supply, future demand for skills, which, to which I'll turn to the demand for skills now. The chart I have up, on, up here shows two scenarios. The very light blue bar here, sorry, um, the dark blue bar I mean, shows the Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre's baseline scenario. And what I should say is our baseline scenario for future jobs growth is quite subdued. We're projected to create around 45,000 jobs over the next decade. To put that in context, Northern Ireland created about three times as many as that in the pre-recession decade. So it's quite a, quite a weak job outlook, which is linked to really the government's austerity programme and the likely impacts that's going to have on, on recruitment going forward across not only the public sector, but the wider implications on the private on the private sector. The, the approach we have taken is when planning for skills policy, you should plan for the economy you want to have, not the economy you think you're going to have. If you plan for the economy you think you're going to have and outperform, industry is going to be left with skills shortages across the board. It's best to plan on an aspirational scenario. So the light blue bars set out that aspirational scenario of what of what we would like Northern Ireland to do over the coming decade, and that's create more jobs, so around double the amount of jobs that we have under our baseline scenario, and in high wage sectors, such as professional services, advanced manufacturing, ICT, so those sorts of sectors where we're seeing higher wage jobs. So any, any figures which I present going for, for the rest of these slides are based upon this high growth scenario, because we're, we're planning for success. This chart is an important overview of how the Northern Ireland labour market works. So once you convert the number of jobs into people-based terms, so this is the number of people in jobs, There's more, some people have more than one job, and this accounts for that, we're left with about 830,000 people in employment. The next circle beside that shows what we're calling the gross annual demand. So this is almost, if you think of the total number of job opportunities within the economy, Often people are drawn a bit too much towards the change in a certain sector, um, how much it's going to grow in net terms. But within each sector, even if it doesn't create any net additional jobs, there are still people who retire, people who leave to go to other employment positions and create a lot of vacancies. And this is an area which is often overlooked when we're thinking about where the jobs are going to be going forward. So a rough rule of thumb, the way the numbers come out, represents about 10% of the the people in employment, so about 10% of people leave their job. It's much higher in other parts of the UK. Um, Northern Ireland has quite low kind of mobility of labour. We, we don't kind of move between sectors and jobs, and we stay in jobs longer compared to, so our replacement demand, as we call that, is a bit lower compared to other parts of the UK. So to go back to your 85,000 number there, a total number of job opportunities, you can see most of those are filled from within the existing labour market. So it's people moving between jobs in the same sector, in the same sector or different sectors, and it's people moving from the unemployment register into employment. The bottom number there, which is 29,000, is what we call the net requirement from education and migration. So this is the number we're looking for 
the number of job opportunities that you can't fill from within the existing labour market. So you need to turn to your education system and, and import some migrants to meet that need. It's not met from within the existing labour market. So the focus of our work is really on this 29,000 number so to help guide what, what the education system needs to produce to meet that demand. And one final point on this slide, when we break down the 29,000 the 29, number, you can see we have two, two call-outs from that. One is called replacement demand, and this refers to the number of retirees and people who leave their jobs that need replaced. And the other one is expansion demand, which is the amount the sector actually grows at in total terms. And the replacement demand is actually about double what the expansion demand is. And again, that's important, going back to that point that sectors don't necessarily have to be growing in order to create a number of job opportunities. If we then go to the, the, the back to the 85,000 total number, total, total job opportunities across the entire economy, and break that down by what we call the NQF level, which is how skills are defined, the very bottom bar is below NQF level two. So this is people who don't have five GCSEs. And you can see that there's still quite a large demand across the entire economy for this group. The reason for that is you can see the sky blue part of that bar, which is vacancies that are filled from within the existing labour market. So although there are a lot of opportunities for those people, the jo those jobs are not taken by people leaving school with not five GCCs. They're largely taken by people who have low qualifications, but they've been in the labour market already. They've got other skills, they've got experience, and they're able to take those jobs. So the important point is there's still jobs for, for people with low skills, but for new young people coming through, there are much, much less. And at the very top level there, you can see there's a much more even split there between uh, NQF level six, which is graduate level demand and above. It's, it's more 50-50. You know, half of those job opportunities are filled by new graduates. Half of them are filled by people within the existing labor market. And if I just focus on the dark, the dark blue section and put that on the, its own chart, you can see the very bottom bar, so low-level skilled people demanded from the existing labour market. It's 16% at the minute. We did work a, a few years, a number of years ago, about 2009, and it was about 22%. So the, the number of people that are able to get jobs from, very, from having low skills is going down over the time period, just as employers are becoming more qualifications hungry for new leavers from the education system. And equally, that's reflected by the high number of graduates that are demanded. So nearly 28% you know, of job opportunities are, are for, for people who have at least an undergraduate degree. And again, that's much higher than when this work has been done in the past to reflect more qualifications hungry employers. We can break down our 29,000 that are demanded from the education system by industry sector. And I think this is often useful to put up because when people think of the of, of where people, job opportunities come from. They often think of the sexy sectors, you know, the high-end engineering, ICT and so on, things that are, are growing quite fast in net terms. And you can see that wholesale and retail is the biggest provider of job opportunities by quite some distance. And it's not that it's growing particularly fast in net terms, it's that it creates a lot of job opportunities through replacement demand. Retail's got a very high turnover. It's a lot of people moving in and out all the time. So I almost think of it as like the unsung hero of the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland labour market, providing opportunities for people, whether it be on a permanent basis or it be on a temporary basis, until they find another job, perhaps more in line with their qualification level. The other bar I want to draw your attention to on this chart is the bottom bar, which is public administration and defence, which across the board in public services, we expect a decline in the number of public sector jobs in, in, in the total terms. Uh, but you st you'll still create jobs in these sectors via replacement demand and people leaving, but there's a bit of a balance in some of these sectors. Um, this is very important, and the, it's useful to highlight the effect that this has. So if I think of, if you look at the, the total stock of all, of all Northern Ireland people in work who have a post-secondary qualification, so anything from a, an HND upwards, the public sector accounts for 45% of everybody. So if you take, if something suddenly happens to the recruitment in that sector, that has wide implications, not only for the number of graduate level people that are required, but also the subject mix of that, those graduate level people. So if public services are very specific to some particular subject areas. I have much more le greater level of detail on some of these slides, which you, you can find online if, if, if anyone is interested. 
just going to one very briefly here, just to highlight the very different nature of recruitment across people with different levels of skills. So the, the pie on the left there shows high level skills. So if something were to happen, say a downturn in professional services or ICT, that would have a very large impact on the demand for high, high skilled people. On the right hand side, you can see that if something had happened to either retail, retail hospitality or manufacturing, that accounts for about half of the, the job opportunities for people with uh, below A level qualifications. So you can see there the different sectoral outlooks become very important for the prospects for people with different levels of skills. Okay, so to turn to the supply of skills, I'll start at the school level supply. So based on demographics, it varies year to year depending upon get demographics. The number of people the school system supplies varies between 20 and 25,000 a year going forward for based on current demographic projections. And I've split those between those who achieve five GCSEs, including English and Maths, which is the, uh, the, the dark bar, and the light bar is those who don't. And we still have quite a high proportion of people who don't achieve five GCSEs, including English and Maths. And if you project forward based on current performance levels, and the demographic projections, we're going to produce 81,000 people over the next decade who don't have five GCSEs, including X and Maz, and that's an enormous number to me. Um, the thing to note about that number is that is when they leave school. Very few people nowadays leave school and go straight into the labour market. They end up doing other things. So particularly, if, you, if we think of those people at the low end, not that many of them will end up in the labour market straight away. They'll get swept up by other parts of the education system. They'll end up in further education, do, repeating things, or they end up um, working with training providers. So the low performance in school does put pressure on other parts of the system. And I think this is evident when we look at the FE qualifiers across the further ed education colleges. So GCSE level and below accounts for over two thirds of individuals qualifying. So this chart, it's individuals qualifying by their highest level of qualification. Well, the important point which I wanted to draw attention to is this level four and five, which are things like HNDs um, and, and foundation degrees, things that are just sub-degree level. We don't seem to produce very many of these at all, especially when you compare them to some of those other bars at the lower level. Um, there's just not a very, a very large supply of people below degree level coming in. Um, so once we put these all together, we can see, you can see that, that four and f level four and five point coming through. You know, it it kind of stick, it sticks out there as being very low. We're, we're not producing very many of those, and there, are, there obviously will be a demand for people with those levels of qualification. So putting the demand and the supply side together, we can look at how that balance works out. And what I should note, whenever I do any balance charts, I only use the navy, this, the dark blue part of supply, because the light blue, these are people who, although they're qualifying, they're going, they're going on to do other things. They're not, they're not joining the labour market. They're going on to further study, taking gap years, going on to, some of them fall into economic activ inactivity. Um, there's, there's various things. So I, those people are netted out of any demand supply balances, which I do, so it's only active participants in the labour market where I produce these balance charts. And so once you do that, you can see at the low level, we still produce too many um, people who are with level two and below qualifications. So there's a challenge there to move people up the qualifications line. And government policy at the moment is moving towards that direction with new youth training initiatives, which feed into the higher level apprenticeship policy and so on. So there is pathways there, which are, which are good and positive. At the mid-level skills, I go back to the lack of supply in level four and five, doing sub-level degrees. That, that's what's driving an un, the undersupply in those areas. It's not that there's excessive demand. There's some demand, but very limited supply, which leads to that undersupply. And at the graduate level, I consider graduate level here broadly in balance. Um, shows a bit of an undersupply, but there's a bit of an oversupply at the master's and PhD level. When you put the two of those together, there's a bit of a tolerance level with these. It's, it's close enough to the middle to say it's graduates are largely in balance. The, the issue with graduates is in the mix of subjects. And when you go into the mix of subjects, um, again, a further detail on this, which I can provide anyone if they're interested, is if the very left-hand side of the chart shows the most oversupplied, sorry, the most undersupplied areas. 
So subjects which are in demand and firms can currently get the people. And they're very much related to the STEM area. So it's maths and technology, sciences, engineering. And it's, it's associated with the scenario of the economy we want to have, of having good advanced manufacturing, good professional services, ICT. I've, I've written STEM there, but I should maybe change that to STEAM. <laughs> Creative arts and design is quite high up there, and there is quite a high demand across a lot of sectors for creative people, and it comes in as a bit of a shortage. On the oversupply side, it goes back to the, the austerity point of limited public sector employment growth. A lot of those subject areas are quite closely related to public services, so you have health, education, social studies, um, things like that which are kind of closely related to public services, so there are where we're getting the oversupply. I'll not go into these charts in much more detail. They just break down the subject areas into much more detail. So the maths and computer science, it's the computer science part of that equation which is causing the biggest undersupply. In terms of oversupply, it's social work and training teachers which come out as number one and two. And when we go down to the foundation degree, HND type level, this NQF level four and five, it's pretty much undersupplied across the board just given the point I made earlier, a lack of people studying those degrees, and the profile of the subjects going from left to right. Again, it's, it's STEM type subjects that are coming out as the most undersupplied areas. Okay, so policy comments. The first point to make is, just going back to my baseline, our, our baseline employment growth. You know, if, if, what, if the level of economic growth occurs, which we, which we currently have in our, our baseline scenario, the result would probably be an oversupply of skills in a number of areas um, if we don't create a necessary quantum of jobs. However, it's worth saying that this is preferable to, to an undersupply of skills for industry. You know, under, an undersupply of skills for industry means it holds back business growth and not only prevents um, job creation now, but it prevents future job creation. Whereas if we have an oversupply, you may have some people who have to leave and go to other parts of the UK to create jobs, but that's preferable to an under skill shortages across the industry. The skills implications of austerity, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, showing how, how much talent the public sector absorbs through recruitment, and once it, but to put a positive spin on this, it does provide a wider pool of talent for the private sector, and obviously a lot of private sector competitiveness is dependent upon the talent it can attract. So if the public sector does tend to recruit less going forward, it's a, it's a wider pool of talent going forward for the private sector. So it's, there's an opportunity there. There is a need to oversupply skills. And what I mean by this is, for, for if, for example, the economy demanded 100 engineers and the university system supplied 100 engineers and businesses went to inter interview them, businesses might not want to recruit those 100 engineers. So there's some of those people within that hundred might not, might not meet the, employ, the firm's personality traits. They might not have necessary employability skills, um, you know, soft skills, communication, team working. And that's, that came out very strongly in our qualitative interviews with employers. A real important focus on these softer skills. It's something that gets overlooked quite a lot. In terms of how we fix this, I think the first thing people often say is it should be included within within university courses, it should be included within schools, introduce employability skills. I think that's part of it, but I think part of it lies with, the responsibility lies on the shoulders of employers as well. Not only for investing and training in their own staff, but also the likes of students, providing a plentiful supply of internships, providing a plentiful supply of student placement opportunities. And I can tell you from, person, from experience on the degree I teach on, there are more students than there are placement opportunities. And it's, if, if, if we want people going into the economy who have the necessary skills on paper, but also have some practical experience, we need to have a, a wider supply of placement opportunities, so employers do need to step up to the plate on that one. Uh, the policy responses to oversupply, so there were some bars there which looked like there were quite a large oversupply of skills in certain areas. Teaching and so on was, were, were some of those. The message here would be not to react, overreact and have a knee-jerk reaction to some of those. Um, sometimes that can be turned into a positive. In the past, Northern Ireland's had a oversupply of lawyers, oversupply of people doing legal services. 
that was able to turn into a positive selling point, and we were able to sell the fact that we had quite a lot of lawyers, and we've had quite a lot of success in the last couple of years through investing in I, bringing in legal services companies. So that can be can be turned into a positive, and also you don't want to overreact and lose the capability for training people in these areas going forward. The image of further education, as well as another point which I just wanted to make, again, going back to that lack of supply for people doing sub-degree sub type qualifications. I think in Northern Ireland, we, the image of further education, we have higher education here and, and further education here. They're not of an equal stature, where in other economies where there's an emphasis on vocational professional skills, the two education systems are, they run in parallel. We don't, we don't quite do that here. There's, there's various different models and a lot of work to go in to see what would, apply, what would best apply to Northern Ireland. I personally like the, the model in, the, in Ireland, um, which uses the Institutes of Technology. And if you speak to any inward investment firm which came in in the 90s, and they, where they got their best skills, they will, they'll, they'll, they'll come back and speak very highly of the Institutes of Technology, and will almost have recruited more of their labour from those than they would have from, from, from universities. And then just to go, I think I made this point earlier, just on, se on sector attractiveness. There are a number of degree subjects in there when we're putting up those balance charts um, where the skills are attractive to a number of sectors. And I think of engineers and ICT. You know, those, those two, you know, engineers just aren't attractive to manufacturing and ICT people just aren't attractive to the ICT sector. They're attractive to finance, professional services, other things. And sectors have got to realise they're not just competing with firms in their own industry for some of this talent, they're competing across industry. And there's a job there to market their sector in, a, in an effective way, to articulate the career prospects, how you would progress through what, you're, what you could expect your salary to be in five years, what you expect to start at now. Um, so there is a, there's a role there for it on, on sectors to promote, their, to promote themselves. And also companies should broaden their own search criteria, perhaps not stick too closely to demand supply balances and subject level. And I think of my own recruitment here. Any time I've recruited a junior economist in the past, the job and the job advertisement has always said you must have an economics degree. And we changed that this year when we were to do some recruitment to say an economics degree or an economics component. And we started to get applications from computational finance people and, and geography and other in other sec other subject areas. And we ended up taking a non-economics person for the role. So sometimes there's, there's talent out there beyond the subject you think it's in. Um, one final point I should make just before I stop is in turn, all of those numbers I presented were based on the, scenar the economic scenario for where we'd like Northern Ireland to be in 10 years' time, which we agreed with the Department for Employment and Learning. This is quite a flexible model. So if there, the Assembly came up with a new economic strategy with employment targets to say, we want advanced manufacturing to deploy an X number of people by 2025. We can run those numbers through, through the model in order to then to say, on the basis of those targets, here's what the skill requirements would be. Um, that's me done, I think. Thanks very much.